Um, so we're going to split this talk. Um, and I just want to start with a myth that you're very probably very familiar with. It's one we hear in all sorts of contexts. But what we put up here is a quote from the late Don Dunstan, the former premier of South Australia, well-recognized promoter of multiculturalism. Um, this was in an address to a conference on Italian heritage in 1986. Um, you can see what he says here, among other things. He says, Italian food styles and habits swept this country with the migrants, right? Uh, we expect, as it would be today, that this would be well received by Italians in the audience who would have loved to hear how they'd been responsible for civilizing Australia through their food. Similarly, prominent Walkley award-winning journalist David Dale put it, um, their parents and grandparents transformed us, Australia, in just 50 years from one of the dullest places on the planet to one of the most interesting places, helping to make our national drink cappuccino, our national dish spag bowl, and our national attitude playful and generous. Dunstan and Dale are not alone in these sorts of observations. Dunstan does not explicitly make the connection uh, from these changes in food habits <coughs> to the Italian migrants um, who arrived after World War II, but this typical connection um, is all over popular literature in particular, but even historical literature to date. Um, it's these Italians who are most frequently applauded, not just for introducing <coughs> Australians to Italian ingredients and cuisine, but helping to revolutionize their eating habits and even their culture. However, as we show in this paper, the simplistic view on how Italian food came to be what some now consider to be Australia's most popular ethnic cuisine fails to reflect the actual complex history of its uptake. Instead, as we show in this paper, visions and ideas of glamorous Italy laid the groundwork for reception of Italian food in Australia. So compare the following. First, if we think about in the 19th and early 20th century, the small number of Italian migrants in Australia who were generally perceived as members of a cultured and artistic group, according, for example, to Sir James Goebel. There were many intellectuals, artists, singers, scientists, skilled craftspeople amongst the earliest arrivals. In contrast, however, as more Italian migrants came to Australia, particularly starting in the 1920s and 30s, the voices that believed Italians were dirty, unassimilable, and would take jobs away from hardworking Australians began to be heard. The lead up to and World War II itself obviously did nothing to quiet these voices. Under the White Australia policy, Italians were, according to historians Janice Wilton and Richard Bosworth, scarcely approved. Italians were the aliens that Australian public and political opinion deemed to be the chief infringers of British Australia. US historian Donna Gabaccia argues that largely Protestant countries viewed Catholic Italians as racially ambiguous. So this relates to what Jason was saying a minute ago. Neither white nor black, Italians were the Chinese of Europe in the US, Canada, and Australia. In the 1950s, as the post-World War II mass migration program got underway in earnest, the pressures for Italians and other migrants to assimilate were high. But Italians did not tend to assimilate, and they continued to attract considerable negative attention. So just another example. In 1954, the Sun Herald published a feature article which reflected on the character of Italian migrants and their suitability for assimilation into Australian society. The journalist made observations of Italian migrants on board a ship bound for Australia. He described the female migrants as hysterical, inappropriately passionate, or simply dirty. As he put it, one woman provided the highlight of the day by screaming and weeping, running back to her family until she finally came aboard, kicking, weeping, and crying out, but carried by two perspiring policemen. These pictures are actually from sort of a different context, but they go along with the kinds of quotes that are in that article on the previous slide. In that article, the journalist goes on to observe an Italian mother beating her child, as he put it, slapping him about the face and bottom, and kissing him wetly in between slaps. She was, I discovered, a southerner. Passions run hot in the south of Italy. He goes on to say, there were other instances, too, on the debit side for the migrants, such things as those that use the deck as a convenience, or the women who had to be ordered to wash at nights. This account suggests that these Italian, largely female migrants, were representative of the Italians already in Australia, but also those who were on their way on the increasing number of migrant boats. It's not to say that the article universally presented Italians in a bad light. He actually acknowledges that Italians did have some good points. They were able to work hard, they could take a joke, and they could sing well. <laughs> However, the article is representative of the deep ambivalence that Anglo-Australians have felt towards the migration of Italians. Keep all this background in mind. 
In contrast, we can see here that the portrayal of the Italian migrant could never have been further from the press coverage enjoyed by Italian models who arrived in 1955, just a year after the article on migration that we're quoting from was published. Under the headline, Beautiful Latins in our Italian Parades, the Australian Women's Weekly announced the staging of a series of fashion parades to be held around the country. Four Italian models were flown down to Australia to, quote, introduce Australian women to the elegance and drama for which Italian clothes are famous. In Sydney, the premiere took place at the department store David Jones, whose restaurant was decorated to resemble Florence's P.T. Palace, where Italian fashion designers had begun to show their clothes in the early 1950s. Guests would enjoy a four-course Italian dinner with matching Italian wines. The event was described as the epitome of Italian glamour. The models also graced the cover of Australian Women's Weekly, looking elegant, full-length coats and gloves. Thus, numerous Australians, Women's Weekly would have been a primary source at this point, saw Italian models being portrayed as the personification of Italy, its glamour and its style. So what we try to do in this paper against this background, this ambivalence, this tension, is try to think about how it was possible for Italian food to become acceptable and evenly incredibly popular when Italian migrants were not. We argue the case of Italian food conceptual factors were critical. And this relates to the ideas, imaginings, and meanings which Italy embodied for Australians, even if migrant Italians did not. We look beyond sort of the typical factors that have dominated in food history for explaining food change in Australia. So things like immigrants brought their food or industrialization powered food change to show that conceptual factors were really essential in the story about how Italian food came to be popular. <coughs> so a bit about Italian food in Australia. Um, in the 1950s, Italian food undeniably began its ascent to popularity here. Despite media accounts suggesting it was brought to Australia with a large wave of migrants after World War II, it's actually the fact that Italian ingredients and recipes have existed in Australia since colonial times. Parmesan, pasta, and olive oil could be brought on the streets of Sydney by at least the 1830s. Italian cheese and prosciutto were on sale in Melbourne CBD by around the 1850s. One could find a recipe for macaroni dressed with olive oil, garlic, anchovies, and olives published in a Sydney newspaper in 1890, and a recipe for fresh pasta, so-called homemade vermicelli, in an Australian cookbook of 1895. In the 1920s and 1930s, Italian recipes like zaglioni and frito misto could be found in the admittedly few books which focused on so-called continental cookery. From the same period onward, the well-heeled could eat at a number of Italian restaurants or cafes, most famously those in Melbourne CBD. Despite this history, it was really in the 1950s that Italian food went mainstream, which probably accounts for what we're saying is a myth, that post-World War II Italian migration was responsible for this rise in popularity of Italian food, because they, they did coincide. While immigration is most popularly invoked explanation for the Australian dietary revolution, it's not the only theory. Most famously, the historian Michael Simons rejected it completely in favor of industrialization. Other scholars have put forward theories including the effect of increased travel to Europe, particularly after the war, economic prosperity, and the influence of the media, or some combination of all of these. However, um, we started down this path in part because it was important to start to think that there had to be something positive about the way in which Italians, or maybe Italy, were viewed in Australia that allowed Italian food to become so popular at this point in time. So over to Paul. Okay. So how was Italy imagined in Australia in various time periods? So before Italy meant pizza and pasta and espresso coffee um, in Australia, there were associated meanings and ideas that had actually very little to do with food. These ideas did not remain static and they evolved over time, though we have divided them into two distinct periods for the purposes of this analysis today. So Romantic Italy, uh, which Joseph Lepianco kind of hinted at this morning and started describing how uh, Italian high culture had influenced colonial Australia. Um, that refers to the ideas about Italy that were in circulation in Australia throughout the 19th and early 20th century. So these ideas were largely the product of high Italian culture and were inherited directly from the English. Glamorous Italy, on the other hand, built upon associations developed in the Romantic Italy phase, but reflected the popular culture that emerged in the 1950s. So in this talk we concentrate on the glamorous Italy period, 
Uh, but it's useful to briefly explore the roots from which this period developed, which is Romantic Italy. <clears throat> so historian Ross Pesman pointed out that Romantic Italy was exported to the colonies as part of the cultural baggage of the educated immigrants and in English books and periodicals. So while this cultural baggage was actually accumulated initially at least during the Renaissance in England, it was the second wave of Italomania that had a more direct impact on Australian colonial life. This second wave was fueled by the Romantic era which looked to Italy's rich cultural past as material, settings and inspiration for artistic and literary endeavour. Pesman argues that Australia began to look inwards in the 20s and 30s, the 1920s and 30s, and there were less obvious cultural links to Italy at this time. As one would expect, Italy's entry into the Second World War damaged but did not destroy these cultural associations. It was not till the late 1950s that Italy became fashionable again. We contend not because of mass migration of Italians, but rather due to social changes in Italy and a resurgence in Italian cultural products in Australia. So fast forward to the 1950s and return to the Italian Fashion Parades, which Rachel discussed slightly earlier. So the description of the inaugural <coughs> event, as well as the many articles published in the lead up and in the aftermath of the parades, all emphasise the beauty, excitement, artisanal excellence and style of Italy and Italians. The models themselves were described as typically Italian, as well as beautiful willowy Italian mannequins with perfect manners, warm charm and vivacity. The clothes were said to reflect the excitement and vitality of life in Italy. And the setting, which also included murals of Italy's architectural wonders, as well as an Italian menu designed by the wife of the Italian minister to Australia, all worked to create a package of Italian glamour, ready for consumption by sophisticated Australian women. But what exactly is glamour? It's a notoriously difficult term to define, even though it's ubiquitous in modern culture. Cultural historian Stephen Gundel, who's written a history of glamour, uh, believes glamour is linked to dreaming, aspiration, and even magic. Now, I'm not going to read the entire quote. You can do that while I have a glass of water. <laughs> But the bit that I really wanted to point out is that idea of glamour took shape as an enticing image of the fabulous life. So in the wake of Italy's economic miracle, which began in the 50s, the country became known for creating these enticing images of the fabulous life, all supported by Italian consumer products, commercial entertainment and cultural outputs. Italian designers were able to successfully market the idea that buying made in Italy meant buying a sense of the beautiful. The idea that things of beauty, a critical feature of glamour according to Gundel, came from Italy, had its roots in the Renaissance, during which the idea of Italian good taste was born. The concept that Italian material products were beautiful may have come from that link to the Renaissance, but the abilities to project glamour owe much to the phenomenon known as Hollywood on the Tiber. In the early 1950s, in a bid for cheap production costs and to attract European markets, amongst other reasons, Hollywood began producing movies in Rome's Cinecittà. This arrangement resulted in Hollywood film stars whom Gundel calls the most complete embodiment of glamour that there has ever been, flock en masse to Rome. Women such as Gina Lollobrigida, Sofia Loren and Silvana Mangiano came to embody Italian glamour and style internationally and according to some press reports beat Hollywood stars at their own game. Film historian Rika Buckley contends that these women quote, achieved an interesting combination of Hollywood glamour, aristocratic elegance <coughs> and earthy naturalness which combined to form a type of glamour that was associated with Italy and Italianness. Now, we here far away in Australia were made aware of Italy's golden age of glamour through movies produced at the time, particularly Hollywood films set in Italy, such as Roman Holiday and Three Coins in the Fountain, but also the, the um, 1960 work La Dolce Vita, so darker Italian films. Uh, the Hollywood films of Lauren and Lola Brigida in particular enabled the glamour attached to these stars to reach large audiences in Australia. Beyond the films themselves, Australian newspapers and magazines were full of gossip, scandal and news from both the celebrities in Italy and Italian stars in Hollywood. Life in Plush Line Playgrounds, a feature in the 1957 Australian Women's Weekly, which you see there, was typical as it covered the international jet set who was said to live in a mad world of mink-lined luxury. <laughs> <laughs> 
That would be fun. <laughs> Australians were actually able to access these images of glamorous Italy, not just through the media and the movies, but through real life experiences. So in that example of the Italian fashion parades, it's easy to see how Australian women could be seduced into thinking that Italy meant glamour, not just by the clothes on parade, but by their links with cultural products, including music, food, architecture, art, and less tangibly, but most importantly, Italian female beauty. The Argus even printed a recipe for Pizzelli alla Romana from Lully, one of those Italian models, thus making the link from glamour to food explicit. That these shows were produced by Australia's most popular women's magazine, and you can't really understate the popularity of the Australian Women's Weekly in this period, um, and hosted by the country's premier department store, Dave Jones in Sydney, Maya in Melbourne, or my emporium, known at the time for being the purveyors of all that was sophisticated and innovative, gave the experience both authenticity and credibility. These department stores also subsequently hosted a number of Italian festivals, where Australians were able to encounter Italian consumer goods in settings which recreated examples of both high and popular Italian culture. The best known of these was the David Jones Italian Festival of 1966, which featured a 16-foot, one-ton plaster replica of Michelangelo's David. The Sydney store had to be partially dismantled to get this statue in place. Another way for Australians to experience glamorous Italy was to visit the espresso bar. In Sydney, for example, the Anglo-Australian espresso bar trend began in the mid-1950s. While the coffee that sputtered from the impressive and eye-catching gudger machines at the centre of these establishments was important, it was the setting that really made a statement. Of course, Italian migrants in Sydney did consume espresso coffee before that time, but their venues were not described in the mainstream press, nor were they notable for their architecture or design. <coughs> espresso bars aimed at Italian clientele seemed, served a very different purpose than did the mainstream espresso bars. While the latter served up Italian glamour, the former were places which the newly arrived migrants could use as community centres. There was crossover between the two scenes, but they were largely separate. Purpose-built espresso bars for non-Italians were designed to be as, quote, modern as tomorrow. They could include art galleries, and in one case on Pitt Street in the centre of Sydney, an espresso bar was even designed to resemble a spaceship. <laughs> the marriage between a new way of drinking coffee with a modern surrounds created fashionable places to see and be seen, as well as an alternative to socialising in the pub, which is particularly important for women. That the coffee in these bars was recognisably Italian, and that the setting provided in which to consume the drink echoed the modern sensibilities of Italian design, lent the sheen of Italian glamour to the experience. Another example of the impact that glamorous Italy had on Italian food in Australia is demonstrated by Anglo-Australian company Legos, which most of you would be familiar with. Founded by the son of Cornish immigrants in the 1890s, Legos tomato-based products were originally marketed as proudly from Bendigo in country Victoria. In the 1950s, a change in marketing strategy saw the company begin to slowly associate the Legos brand with Italy and Italian food. And you can see that in the can in the picture there, because there's a lot of Italian language on their tomato paste product. Uh, by the 1970s, Lego described itself as authentico, albeit spelt incorrectly, and linked itself with symbols of Italy, but very crucially, not with Italian migrants. That Italianness could be seen as that Italianness could be seen as a positive in 1950s Australia by a mainstream food company when there was still much ambivalence regarding the inclusion of Australian migrants as members of white Australia seems incongruous. How can that work? However, the apparent tension is dissolved when we consider the positive meanings that Italy carried for Anglo-Australians, meanings that Legos was very careful to exploit in its marketing. The invented Italian ethnicity of Legos was aligned with Italian glamour, sophistication and style, which was far removed, as we saw in the initial article, from the way that actual ethnicity of Italian migrants was presented in Australia. In the 1970s, Lego cemented the link with the concept of glamour by using one of Italy's most famous film stars to advertise their brand, Gina Lola Brigida. Even though in that picture she looks like she's never cooked a thing in her life. <laughs> <laughs> Which takes us to today. So popular media visions of Italy today place Italian migrants at the centre, using an approach that we might refer to as authentic Italy, 
while the romantic and glamorous Italy phases relied solely on ideas of Italy which were largely divorced from Italian migrants themselves. Authentic Italy celebrates these Italian migrants as, nearly finished, <laughs> celebrates these Italian migrants as ambassadors of this better way of living. These ideas do require further research, but studying public representations of Italian-related material in the 90s and 2000s would likely reveal the existence of the idea of authentic Italy, where Italians are viewed as carriers of a more real and genuine culture that have close ties to the land, value artisanal production, and enjoy a slower way of life. It's no accident that slow food is from Italy. This image here of well-known chef and Italy Australian guy Grossi and hipsters engaging in the production of tomato sauce is evidence of a new way of imagining Italy, its people and its food. <coughs> Thinking about authentic Italy and how it differs from what we have talked about today, what is clear is that Italian migrants, or certain types of Italian migrants, in Australia have finally gained the cultural capital which ideas of Italy have almost always had in this country. The question remains about whether and how real migrant practices are represented. The photo there is the Camerano family sauce day for myself and my mother. Um, <laughs> and what status they have. So, to conclude, how did Italian food become acceptable and even popular when Italian migrants were not? This is the question at the heart of this paper. And our approach pointed us to broader trends. <laughs> the ideas, imaginings and meanings associated with glamorous Italy were central. Thus, conceptual factors rather than material factors alone, and we're not discounting those material factors, by the way, this is sort of an extra layer on top, can be essential to acceptance of migrant food ways. Future research is needed on historic and contemporary trends associated with Australia's on-loving love affair, ongoing love affair with Italian food and products. Thank you. Uh, and here's some further reading. This is kind of all the research that our paper is based on. So if you want to look those up, you're most welcome to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.